As we continue in integrated rangeland management down this road of uh, honing our skills as grazing managers, now we're going to talk about those specific grazing methods or systems that can be applied to, to manage goals on land. Keep in mind there's a lot of things that a grazing system or a grazing management plan can do. It can help the vegetation, it can improve the ecological quality of the land. Um, these uh, items are from the National Rangeland and Pasture Handbook. Another thing that they say there is that you can improve the efficiency of grazing through uniform use of all grazing units. So that is one thing that we do know if you graze smaller units pr appropriately, you can have uniform use across. What can grazing methods not, uh, not um, accomplish? They can't rectify mismanagement because of some other larger overriding factor, such as the wrong species, an incorrect stocking rate, or some major distribution problem, such as water not being available except every three miles, or in this, uh, these graphs below, you see this really, really steep country on the right-hand side and those black spots on the landscape are, um, are cows. A grazing system isn't going to help that animals use those landscapes. It's going to take something else. Um, another, and when we have really long, um, large, long-term woody encroachment into plants, that's got to be accomplished by a season and a type of animal. A grazing method is not going to accomplish changes in those systems. Okay, so let's talk about these systems. We'll talk about the first, which is the kind of easiest grazing system that can be done and that is what we call continuous or season long. It's just one pasture, livestock are placed on that pasture in the spring and they're removed at the end of the season. Um, or in other words they're grazed all year or all season in one pasture. So there's some advantages to this system. One, it's really simple. Um, the, the input, the cost and in input is pretty low. You just have to have a, a good perimeter fence around the outside. Um, there is also an advantage because livestock production can be really high on these continuous season-long systems because animals have all the choice they need. They can uh, choose any plant, any time across that landscape. Of course, there are quite a few disadvantages, too. One is if you've got a really, really large pasture or a large allotment, you may have difficulty actually managing or finding the cattle, so that can be a problem. Um, plants that are available, the ones that animals will eat, even though it's healthy for them to have maximum choice, they're always going to eat their favorite plants. So we tend to see in season-long systems, we often see the most desirable plants um, being at a disadvantage because they're the ones that are always eaten. And the same can be true of riparian quality. If you look at that stream going down the middle of this pasture, animals have access to that all year round. That can be okay if it's not really heavy grazing, but on the other hand, in the summer, every summer, animals are probably going to camp out on that on the riparian vegetation there, so it can be pretty hard on riparian systems. Um, also, it's not very well adapted. Season-long systems are not really great on areas that have a lot of topographic challenges. Uh, so on the other hand, these systems can work really well in fairly small, moderate-sized pastures, in the plains or in areas where we have um, moisture in the summer, areas where there's not a huge riparian concern, and where most of the plants growing are good forage plants, and there's not a lot of differential, not a lot of differential between the desired and undesirable plants. So the system can work really well in some places, and it's a challenging in others. To overcome some of those challenges, the next system up in intensity would be a deferred rotation system. So here's a pasture, here's a set of three, I'm sorry, a set of four pastures that are um, managed. The, the three pastures that are managed in this case are the north pasture, the upland pasture, and the south pasture. 
Um, what we see here is that the three pastures are managed and one is deferred every year. In other words, one is not grazed until after seed set. So uh, in the year one we see that the upland pasture is deferred and the north pasture starts out being grazed and then animals are moved to the south pasture and then they're finally moved to the upland pasture later in the year. And the next year the deferred pasture is the north pasture so animals start in the south pasture, they're moved to the upland pasture and then later in the summer they're moved back to the north pasture. So the north pasture did not have any grazing in that period from initiation to seed set and then it only received grazing at the end at the end of the season. So that's so you see on this chart that we the first year the upland pasture is deferred, the next year the north pasture is deferred, and then the la last or third year in this rotation the south pasture was deferred. That's why it's called the deferred rotation because it's the actual deferment that is being rotated. Not the cows, I mean the cows are being rotated too, but the important point is that the deferment is being rotated. Um, some important points of this system one is that uh, the animals are using all of the units. They're using all of the available area. So there's no extensive stocking rate. There's no high stocking rate involved. And um, and that's that's good because you're taking a stocking rate and you're, you're taking a number of animals and you're spreading them across the whole units. The stocking rate is actually fairly low. And uh, animal performance is still fairly high because animals still have quite a bit of use of the area and they are able to choose their their um, diets. Not quite as high as that continuous system, but still pretty good. Uh, riparian areas can benefit from this because they're at least only going to be grazed once every three years during that really hot, dry season. The other two years out of any three, they would um, um, they would be rested or um, deferred, so they would not be grazed. Uh, and uh, also it's an advantage to wildlife because um, there's always going to be some pastures that are not being used by livestock. And the flip side of that, there's always going to be some pastures that were just used by livestock. And often we find with large ungulates like deer and elk um, and pronghorn that they often, those animals like following the cattle or the sheep because the, the livestock will take down some of the dead material and then that makes for good resources. So we often see wildlife following the livestock and this system allows for that. Next step up then is a rest rotation system. In this case we have three pastures. A lot of rest rotations are based on three pastures. The difference between this and deferred rotation is that now one of the pastures is rested for a whole year. So you see in year one of this diagram the spring pasture is grazed early in the season. Then animals are moved to the hill pasture and during that time the creek pasture is not grazed at all that whole year. Okay, that's good because it gives some pastures rest for a whole year and it means that the plants that aren't going to be grazed by livestock, they might be grazed by wildlife, but they're not going to be grazed by livestock for that whole year. It's bad because you're taking all of your animals and you're concentrating them in two-thirds of the area. At least in this case when you had three pastures they'd be concentrated in two-thirds of the area. So unless this is a um, unless there's a decrease in stocking rate with rest rotations, we can see kind of heavy use of areas that are grazed in each year. On the other hand, that use is um, is followed by a long period of rest. The downside to this pasture it has to do with animal performance. We often see relatively well lower animal performance in rest rotation systems because animals are always going on to a pasture that was deferred or rested, meaning there's always a buildup of biomass, of dead biomass. So they have to swart through that dead biomass before they can get to the green, better forage. So animal performance can be quite low in rest rotation systems. The flip side to that, these systems weren't designed so much with livestock in, in mind. They were designed with giving plants every opportunity to reseed themselves. So what you see in these systems is that um, a pasture will not be grazed in spring till the plants go to seed, then they will be grazed as a way to tromp the seed into the soil, and then that same pasture will be rested for the following years. Okay, so for example, look in this diagram we have in year one, the hill pasture is not grazed from April to July, then it is grazed in August through, through November. During that time, the grazing can shatter the seeds and stomp them into the ground. The following year, 
the hill pasture is not grazed at all. So those plants that were stomped into the ground can now turn into um, turn into plants. Now, uh, I don't know that there's a lot of data that shows that this actually does yield more new plants, but that certainly is the design behind the system. The one of the, here's an example of one of the most intensive systems we have. That would be a rest. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a short duration or a high intensity, low frequency system. It's where you have multiple pastures and every pasture is grazed by a lot of animals for a short period and usually each individual pasture is grazed several times per year. So let's just take a look at this A pasture and if you look at the diagram down there it's grazed in January and then it's grazed again in May and then it's grazed again in July and then it's grazed again in November. So that pasture is grazed for only a few days, 10, 15, 7 days but it's grazed multiple times a year. This system was designed to um, mimic some of the systems in Africa where you have large herds of wildebeest and then other kinds of, prong of antelope coming through the system. And so you see these waves of animals. The advantage from the animal standpoint is that at least several times a year the animal has um, green forage to go on, regrowth. So the, the system was really designed with animals in mind but it also has the advantage of leveling the playing field of all the plants. So you put a lot of animals into one pasture at one time that restricts their choices between plants, but it does make sure that all the plants are grazed. So it makes sure that the desirable plants aren't always getting hit, that the undesirable or less desirable plants are also getting eaten. So these um, intensive systems often involve higher stocking rates and they have you know, a large number of animals on pastures for a short period. They can be quite effective in areas where you have rain during the growing season or at least throughout most of the year. They tend to not work as well out here in the Intermountain West where we have a pretty short period of moisture. So, they, so these systems are really adapted to just a few areas where there's moisture throughout the year and can really handle that higher sustained grazing. Another whole set of systems could best be just defined as decisional, decisional or management intensive systems. These are systems that have just one herd and many pastures, multiple pastures, and the decisions about whether to move the animals and where depends on the amount of forage that's available, the amount of water, um, what activities are happening in the livestock unit such as calving or lambing. Um, they, they're often used to facilitate other practices such as haying or stockpiling enough forage for prescribed, great, uh, for prescribed fire. And then finally, these systems are probably the most common in the world and their success can be really high or low depending on the, the, bill, the ability of the manager, the decisions of the manager. Some names that we would call these decisional systems would include the best pasture system, this is where you move livestock to pastures that look best in terms of forage availability. It was designed in the arid southwest, is used a lot in sort of New Mexico, Arizona, those areas, because oftentimes uh, a storm will come through and it, it may put a, several inches of rain on a, on a pasture, but it might just be on one pasture or one area of the ranch. So in order to use that um, green forage, the manager makes a decision to go to the best pasture available. Complementary systems such as those that are up in the central plains are where you have a pasture and a cultivated area. You, you've, you've cultivated some part of the ranch to have green forage either early in the season or late in the season. So you're, you're making a pasture to complement the rest of the range. So that's a complementary or decisional system. Um, when you have t elevation uh, to give you the advantage to be able to go to green forage at higher elevation, um, you can accomplish a seasonal suitability system. Seasonal suitability is just the idea that you're following the green. You're always going to put animals on higher and higher elevation because of the growth pattern of different vegetation types. So that's a seasonal suitability system. In Idaho, this following the green or seasonal suitability is often seen where we start out in the winter range, um, down in the salt desert shrub where the shrubs in the winter, a few grasses to give that energy and shrubs to give the protein. Animals stay down there during the winter months. Then they start to move in the bench lands. They have a, there's a whole set of spring fall ranges that green up in April, May time and animals graze those. Oftentimes that's where we have animals calving or lambing out. 
It's a very common system used in sheep production, so you have lambing occurring in that spring-fall range. From then on, animals just follow up the mountains, up into the summer range. We're up in the summer range, it's high elevation. There can be snow pack up into June or July, so you can have green forage up until it starts to cool down in August, September. In the case of sheep, usually those owners will ship the lambs off of the mountain in September, take them to sale, because by that time they'll be fat, ready to eat, ready to sell, and then they'll just slowly move the, the um, ewes down the mountain into that spring-fall range again, and then down onto the winter range. This system also works with cattle, uh, just that the calves uh, may have to be brought off and brought to some higher quality forage in that September, October, November. We'll often see the, cat, the steers and, and heifers being taken off and gone, going to, to higher quality forage. It's a pretty simple system. Age old system works really well because the animals are always on green forage and the vegetation usually has time to recover. Once the animals get off, there's still enough resources and time for those plants to recover. So it can be really easy on the range and really easy on the animals. Which method is best? Well, it really depends. I've seen all of these methods work and all of these methods fail depending on the skill of the manager and depending on what management goals are, whether it be for livestock performance, whether riparian areas are a concern, whether livestock production is the issue, whether there's a concern over wildfire or, or risk, uh, and, and how the, the landscape would respond to that. So all of these systems can be good at one time and maybe poor at others. So there's no one system fits all. It depends on the skill of the manager. Nearly all systems can work and nearly all systems can fail. There are thousands of variations on the theme. All of these examples in this um, PowerPoint are uh, of one herd systems, multiple pastures, or one pasture and one herd. There's a whole set of systems that are designed with multiple herds. So there's a like there's just variations on this theme depending on how many pastures you have, exactly what the rest deferment grazing rotation combinations are are quite endless. But no matter the system, you've got to get the stocking right, the species of animal, and you've got to pay attention to distribution patterns because the the grazing method is just one of the parts of the equation, and all methods need to be flexible to be managed, and so. If the manager is good and they have the flexibility, they can manage for disturbances on the ground, such as fire, weeds, um, uh, uh, drought, uh, animals uh, used by wildlife or by wild horses. All of those things are things that can change a management plan and it requires flexibility. So that's about the main aspects, a uh, very simplified version of grazing methods. There's some other readings in this class that will give you some more of the details for each method. Uh, but keep your eye on the ball. It's a manage of it's just a, an aspect of managing the time that pastures are grazed or or rested. And then we'll next talk about distribution and some of the other elements about making your grazing method successful.